Sí, pero toda la sesión no, 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 no puedo. Muy buena tarde a tothom. Uh, primero de todo, un vos la bienvenida. Welcome to everybody to the first session we have of this uh, scientific dialogues. The Academia Europea is one of the main institutions uh, that deals with science in Europe. And there are activities all over Europe, and there are activities that are extremely different and wide. Here in Barcelona, we have what we call a hub. There are several hubs all over Europe, I think now it's six. And there are lots of activities, academic activities in all of them. Uh, we had an activity here in this place that is the, the RACAP, the Royal Academy of Arts and Science, for which we are very grateful to the president and of the institution. And uh, we are going to have a session every month. Uh, in fact, in the next weeks, we'll have a little more than that because we began a little late. And uh, there will be two kinds of activities. Uh, one activity like today will be scientific dialogues what do we call frontiers of science so just to see which are the the the, the frontiers uh, of of the science we are doing and to show that here in our society in our neighborhood we have uh, science of first class so these dialogues will be in english and that's the reason where we begin uh, today in English, and uh, these are the idea of showing the some of the the main and the top uh, problems that arise from the development of science and technology. In general, there will be a debate between or the the, the point of view of two different persons, and. Uh, we will try to have a dialogue between between them. Sometimes we'll be someone of science and the other one of social sciences, but in general the debate will be in the forefront of science and technology. The other uh, the other uh, dialogues will be either in Catalan or Spanish and will be uh, uh, of a wide, much wider. Uh, audience and uh, we will be also similar to that but instead of going into the the top level of science we'll try to get into scientific and technological problems that they have a social relevance so something that people really uh, are worried about so the first one will be aging are we going to stop aging yes or not and we'll have in both cases, people that are at the forefront of discussion will have others on the origin or how, what is language. So you have, uh, you have a, a piece of paper in which we have these four sessions. And any of you, if you have suggestions on which kind of uh, dialogues would be of interest, we are open to accept them. So this is one of the main activities that we'll have in this, uh, in this Barcelona hub of the Academia Europea, which is an institution, uh, the, the, the hub by itself is just a, a, a small institution inside the Fundació Catalana per la Recerca i la Innovació, to which we are also extremely grateful, Jordi, and uh, they provide us with a place and with an uh, institutional framework for our activities. Besides these activities, we'll keep doing the Hipatia Prize that is going to be open this week, and we hope to have lots of people applying for that. We'll have also uh, a big debate that will be announced also very soon and also other activities that will come. 
So I I leave you uh, with the with this first scientific dialogue that as all the dialogues will be uh, possible to follow here uh, directly or online. And uh, today we have Chiara. Oh, I don't remember your surname. Something. Something. <laughs> Chiara Santolin. Uh, uh, Chiara, uh, uh, today we had uh, we had uh, Nuria Sebastian, uh, but this morning she could not talk at all, at all. So she was in bed, uh, just uh, really sick. And uh, Chiara. Uh, is a person working in the same in the same unit as Nuria, and uh, she is uh, a very good uh, researcher in the area of psychology. And just to to let you know that she is extremely good. She just got recently, a couple of weeks ago, an ERC. So this means that she's a first class uh, a first class researcher that will conduct this uh, discussion. Thank you. Chiara. Yeah, no. It works. Yeah, now it works. Okay, so let's do it from the beginning. Um, so today's session is uh, titled "Understanding the Brain: Neurobiology or uh, Neurocomputer Sciences." So in this session, we will bring together different approaches and different perspective um, to the study of the brain. Um, so we will see neurobiology psychology and computer science um, and how these different fields, how far they have gone in describing and explaining um, how, how our brain gives rise to how our cognitive functions. And we have uh, two exceptional speakers that will talk about that today. Um, so I'm going to proceed um, to introduce the first speaker, uh, Professor Mara Dearson. So Professor Dearson is a group leader at the Center for Genome Regulation of Barcelona. Um, uh, in her lab, um, they focuses on the neurobiology of learning and memory and their the perturbations when there are um, brain disorders. So um, she uses a multidisciplinary approach. Um, so she combines different techniques that she will probably explain after, um, including uh, neurophysiology and calcium imaging. Um, Professor Dearson obtained her PhD in physiology and pharmacology at the University of Cantabria, Spain. Um, after that, she got different positions um, across Europe um, as postdoctoral researcher or assistant professor. I'm really trying my best <laughs> here with this, um, including the Friar Un University of Berlin, um, Universidad Autónoma de Barcelona, Universidad de Cantabria, the Institute de Recerca Oncológica de Barcelona, and then she became a group leader at the Center for Genomic Regulation in 2001. Um, she published a research in top journals, like the Proceeding of the National Academy of Science, Nature, and eLife. Um, she was elected fellow of the Royal Academy of Medicine of Catalonia. Um, her research is funded by the European Union and the Ministry of Tientia uh, Innovation of Spain. Um, her, latest, okay. her latest research has great impact. Okay, sorry again. Um, her latest research has had great impact uh, because she discovered a new treatment um, to improve the cognitive function of individuals with Down syndrome. Um, so we are very thrilled to have you here today. Okay, so thank you so much. And uh, I guess that here I am trying to defend why neurobiology. 
<laughs> is kind of the basis of uh, neural computation in the end, right? So, to begin with, and uh, Gustavo will agree with me, even though Woody Allen was saying that the brain was his second favorite organ, <laughs> to me, brain is my first favorite organ. And I guess for all of you, because none of you could be here listening to my talk without a brain, right? None of you. And aging is fine, but what ages worse is the brain. So what is more important to you guys is neuroscience. And you have to be conscious about that. The European Union is not. They're funding cancer, right? They're not funding brain research. Although brain research is the most important because without brains, there would be no science, no nothing, no humans, okay? So why do we need brains? What is the brain for? Why did we evolve to have brains? The idea is that we need to organize multicellular organs, right? Once we start having a number of cells, we need to coordinate their function. Because without that coordination, we could not live. And this is the function of the brain, right? Brains have also been uh, set to be there because of movement. And there are some organs that are called ascidias. The ascidias, they have a brain when they have to move to find a place to settle. Once they settle, they eat their own brains. It's a little bit like the professors, you know? Once they settle, they lose their brain because they don't need it anymore. Okay. So what does new science? New science tries to understand how the brain works. How from these thousands of cells we create mental activity. We create ideas that are what moves the world forward. Also what destroys the world, it's true. But without brains working, we would not be here, right? We would not have any academia because there would not be ideas. So let's put numbers on that. 8.6 to the 11th number of neurons. Well, this is, you know, how are neurons counted? They are counted in the typical brain of a typical human. What is a typical human? Is a male, like 50 years old, 70 kilograms. They never count neurons of females, you know, probably because we have more. But this is the typical brain, right? Then how many contacts they can make? How many contacts do you guys have? How big is your network? Who has more than, let's say, 100 colleagues? Raise your hands. How many? 50 colleagues. Two colleagues, OK? OK? A couple. <laughs> You are on yourself. OK, good. Like academicians normally do. Good. Normally, even a single pyramidal neuron in the cerebral cortex can make more than 10,000 contacts. This means, computationally, to have 10,000 inputs of information that one cell has to, like, process and take a cellular decision that will affect the rest of the brain, right? Each of these contacts that are called synapses, or as Cajal would say, protoplasmatic kisses, because they are kissing each other, the neurons are kissing each other, and they are 
interchanging not fluids but information, right? So each of those synapses can have millions of molecules. They are really little processors, little chips of information. If we compare with computational parts, right? Uh, in fact, the brain is much more able to store information, to process information, to even relay on information that is stored than our best supercomputers. And it's much more efficient. Our brains do it. it this is, of course, an assumption. It's not completely real. With around 20 watts, whereas a computer needs petabats, right? Gigabats. So, in fact, it's much more efficient. And as we know, there is no computer able to really do the work our own brain does. Right? We need like maybe thousand trials to be good at a task. A computer needs many more, right? Good. But, of course, this requires a whole bunch of computation. And this computation comes from neurons, right? That is the principal unit of the brain, although there are other players that are now uh, really important also. But it also needs connections. It needs networks. You cannot explain cognition based on one neuron, because cognition is an emergent property of the brain, right? Imagine, for example, uh, I don't know if anyone is a football fan, soccer fan, no? Yes, one at least. I mean, if I would ask this question 20 years ago, everyone would say, me, me. Especially in a male audience, male-dominated audience like this, no? Um, but now, you know, it's kind of politically not correct to say, yeah, I'm a soccer fan. Yeah, so if you have gone to a stadium, you have seen these kind of waves, right? So, these waves cannot be explained, you know, the guys doing like this. They cannot be explained if one person is dressed in black or he's tall or short or whatever. It's only explicable by the whole audience. This is emergent property, right? So cognition, even brain physiology, are emergent properties that cannot be explained by explaining only one cell. And this is very important because we have been very reductionistic in science in general, but also in neuroscience. We try to explain everything based on a couple of little neurons in a very tiny region of the brain. That's not the way. We have to look globally at the problems, right? And this is where computational methods will help to understand. So it's not neurobiology or neurocomputation. It's both together. And this is my point today. OK, let's look at the neuron itself, right? This is a neuron. This is a pyramidal neuron. Look how beautiful it is. It makes this brain forest of Cajal, right? It has these beautiful branches, like roses, right? That develop with these little uh, membrane specialization that call, are called spines. Each spine is a contact, is a neuronal contact. So the neuron body receives all this information, it processes all this information, and then it contacts other neurons. And these are called synapses, oh my goodness. 
I make a mess here. Okay. And these synapses are finally their order chemical reaction spaces with millions of molecules. Hmm? So, somehow, here we have the first neurobiological challenge. Because how these contacts are distributed in space will determine how a neuron is connected. And thus, it will determine how a neuron is functioning. Right? So, how these whole dendritic tree, these are dendrites, these arbors are called dendrites, right? How these dendritic trees are distributed in space will determine how they function. It's a little bit, you know, I'm, I was born in the 60s, <laughs> 61. So, in my age, I had the first TV when I was six years of age, something like that. Black and white, of course, we didn't have colors at the time. Um, and we had these antennas, right? Depending on how you locate the antennas, you will get something called the VHF or the UHF. So I, I love the UHF because uh, Ironside, people in my age will know him, was there, right? I loved him. He was an amazing detective. And, uh, you know, it simply depended on how you localize your antennas. So dendrites are like antennas. And depending on how far they go, I can contact you. Or maybe not, I can only contact Joma. Or I can contact both of them. Or both of you. So that's very important for the computational properties of the brain. Right? And what is interesting is that these changes with disease. So when you perturb genetically a brain, you may end up with smaller dendritic trees, with less contact, with a smaller target area. Right? And these will definitely influence how your brain works. So this is what happens, for example, in Down syndrome. Down syndrome is one of our main areas of interest. And this is dependent on a trisomy, a trisomy of a chromosome, a whole chromosome. So it's the most complex genetic perturbation compatible with life. And it affects brain development and brain function. So, what happens in Down syndrome is that these guys have smaller dendritic trees with less contacts. And this means that their target areas are reduced. They cannot reach so far. And this is meaning that they are losing computational power in their neurons. Right? What does this mean at the end? If our brains are processing information, and this is what tells us how the world is, and this is what allows us to function in the world, this means that we will see the reality in a very different way. And this is what happens in Down syndrome. If you look at this model, this is to analyze how the global and local processing goes around in a particular disease, right? So, you see that it's a big D formed by small Ys, right? Everyone sees that? Yes, good. You have local and global processing that is functioning, fine. What happens in people, for example, with Williams syndrome? They only see the little Ys. They don't see the D. What happens with Down syndrome? They only see the D. They don't see the little Ys. And this is because their neurons and their brains are different. So how your brain is built up is de defining how you see the world. This is also why males and females see different a world, right? 
Okay, so how can we study that from the neurobiology point of view? We need models. And let me say it loud and clear. We need, for studying cognition, we need mammalian models. We need, for example, mouse models. Without that, we cannot study it. It's fine if we have organoids. It's fine, but we cannot study cognition there. That's impossible, right? So we do need mammalian models. And mice have helped us a lot. Because there, we can model a trisomy. We can do chromosomal engineering and produce a trisomy. And there, we can understand how a trisomy models the brain, right? But we can also overexpress only one of the 300 genes that are overexpressed in Down syndrome. And this is, would help us to understand whether one gene can recapitulate the symptoms of Down syndrome. And there, we have a pharmacological solution, because there we can target this molecule and reduce the dosage, and then find a treatment. Right? Good. So, the idea here is that very simple brains, like mouse brains or other simple brains, can help us understand much more complex brains, right? So this is why we use mouse model. And very interestingly, in fact, trisomy in mice produces the same effect as trisomy in humans. It produces learning defects, and I will not go into that, but let me tell you that this is how good uh, the mice do. So. The curve here in here I cannot show it to you, but I will. the the gray curve means that the mice learn very fast. The black curve is the trisomic mouse model, and it se it seems it doesn't learn, right? It cannot learn, and also the dendritic trees are smaller in the trisomic mice. So the trisomy in mice leads to the same phenotypes as in humans. So it's a very good model. We have construct and phase validity. Okay? But now we have to dig into that and try to understand which are the genes that are responsible for that phenotype. Because there we can find a treatment, right? Okay, so we have our favorite gene that is called diac one a right? Uh, it's called dual specificity, tyrosine, phosphorylation, regulated kinase 1A, whatever. Don't worry about that. But the, the interesting thing about it is that it's dosage sensitive. I mean, if we have too much or too less of this molecule, our brains do not work. And let me tell you that it's a very finely regulated gene. So, for example, stress regulates that gene. So be careful, because maybe if you are too stressed, you are downregulating your DR1A, and you will get smaller brains in the end. So be careful. OK, so. What we found is that just by overexpressing, just by getting more DR1A in the brain, we can recapitulate all the learning phenotypes and the neural phenotypes of Down syndrome. So DR1A is sufficient to produce Down syndrome. And this opens an opportunity driven by neuroscience, which is normalizing DR1A as a way of normalizing or rewiring our brains, right? And we did this in several ways. We did it using gene therapy. We did it also using a drug. And what we found is that the decrease, and here you see this is called discrimination index, that means discrimination memory, right? The ability to recognize that something new is new. So. Mice overexpressing DR1A that are called TG DR1A 
are very bad at that, but they completely recover when we inhibit the excess of activity of the aquanate. Right? So not only that, but their brains are rewired. So if you see the VT means wild type, that is a normal brain with a normal dendritic tree, these very nice branches that you see there. If you see when I overexpress the aguane, what I see is that this is completely messed up. And then when I treat these mice with an inhibitor, with, when I normalize the activity of the aguane, I completely recover the brain. I rewire the brain. I know maybe you don't understand completely, but this is like a whoa moment, right? Good. So you guys could rewire your brain just by tackling a tiny little molecule that is malfunctioning in your brain, right? So I can bring a neuron, the red neuron, that is not normal to a normal level. And this, we have seen, it also works in Alzheimer's disease and age-dependent cognitive decline. So I encourage you to look at our websites because we are now carrying over a clinical trial in people with mild cognitive impairment. So if anyone feels that you don't remember everything as you did before, just come. We will treat you. No problem. This is what neuroscience does for society, right? OK, so as I say, this is thanks to many people, people that are pharmacologists, clinicians. We do clinical trials. And in fact, in the clinical trial, what we saw is that people with Down syndrome and now people with mild cognitive impairment treated with our drug are in green much better performing cognitive tests that people not treated or people treated with placebo, right? So not only that, but their brains are better connected. So up there in the first uh, line, in the upper line, you see how the brains were reacting to a task before the treatment. They're basically activating the visual cortex because it's a visual task, you know, fine. After the treatment, if you look down there, maybe you can see the eye and you can see here all these areas activated. These are cognitive related areas that were not activated before the treatment. So these brains have been rewired, right? So again, this is what neuroscience can do for you. And here I have to acknowledge, of course, the people with Down syndrome that were participating in our trials. And we have now done also the pediatric study. And let me just say that, to finish, that in my opinion, we are now facing a lot of new revolutions, right? In neuroscience, we are facing a big revolution. And it entails both basic neuroscience and computational neuroscience. And we are also using, I didn't mention that because I wanted Gustavo to say that. We are also using computational neuroscience to put some questions that we cannot put in real life. But in the end, what I think we need in our society is a knowledge revolution, not a technological revolution. IA is fine, it's a tool. But what we need to fight is ignorance. Not autism, not Down syndrome. Let's embrace it. But let's fight ignorance. Thank you.
thank you so much, Mara, for the very interesting talk. Um, for the audience, we are going to keep the questions at the end, so save the questions. And for the people in Zoom, um, you have a Q&A uh, box, so you can write down your question there, but at the end of the question. So uh, our second speaker is uh, Professor Gustavo Deco. He's an ICREA professor and full professor at the University Pompeu Fabra here in Barcelona. He leads the computational neuroscience group that focuses on the computational principles and the mechanisms um, underlying brain functions, such as uh, perception, memory, learning, emotions, and many more. Um, Gustavo Deco obtained three different PhDs, one in physics from the Universidad Nacional de Rosario, one in computer science from the Technical University of Munich, and one in psychology for, from the Ludwig Maximilian University of, of Munich. Um, then he was appointed several postdoctoral positions um, across the, the world uh, at the University of Bordeaux in France, University of Gießen in Germany, he also led the computational neuroscience group at the Siemens Corporate Research Center in Munich before joining the University Pompeu Fabra. Um, he was the director of the Center for Brain and Cognition from 2001 uh, to 2021. Um, his research is continuously funded by the ERC, the Human Brain Project, Generalitat de Catalunya, and the Ministry of Ciencia Innovación. Um, he published multiple times in all the top journals, including Nature, Cerebral Cortex, and eLife. And his, his research had a uh, profound impact on computational neuroscience, and we are very thrilled to have him today. Thank you. Thank you, Kiera, for the kind introduction. And thank you, Chauma, for organizing this and for inviting me and giving me the possibility to, to discuss with you uh, this uh, absolutely relevant epistemological issues about experiments or, com uh, or computation. The, the answer is very clear. I would say I, I am not exactly <laughs> nothing with Mara. I mean, we need, uh, of course, absolutely both sides. Actually, um, uh, from the modeling point of view, there is uh, right now a relatively rich story in neuroscience, uh, starting probably at the beginning of last centuries. There was a very crucial step in the 50s about the modeling of a single neuron. It was a Nobel Prize in the 60s, Hodgkin and Huxley. It's a still a valid model, which means a lot. A friend of mine, Christoph Koch, is saying, if a model in neuroscience survived 10 years, it's a very good model. Uh, and this survived um, 60 years or more. Uh, then in the 70s, 80s, 90s, we started to model uh, microcircuits, uh, some single areas or, or interaction between single areas. And relatively um, late, uh, more or less 15 years ago, we started to model the whole brain label. I will take and I will focus at that label, at the whole brain label, just as an excuse and because it's my field, I think. <laughs> uh, but in order to talk about the possibility, the necessity, and the advantage of modeling, all the three aspects of modeling. So let's start with the, with the whole brain label. As I said, I mean, there is no epistemological discussion here. I mean, we follow in science since Galileo, the epistemological postulate, uh, epistemological postulate of Galileo. So we start doing science by observations by empirical experimental observation that we do in a very disciplined way, as Mara was uh, telling you. In the case of the whole brain label, uh, we, use for, we can use animals, of course, and we use animals. In this case, just I take the human as an interesting animal. And there are two aspects which are here cartoonized. At the bottom, what you see on the left side is the anatomy. This is the structural connectome. We can acquire this in single individuals with a technique, with a, a resonance uh, magnetic imaging technique, particular version of that, which is called diffusion tensor imaging, where we can track the fibers, we can track the widening at this microscopic level. So it's anatomy, it's the, it's the connection between the different brain areas, which have a very particular structure, as you see here, even by this, uh, by this picture. I mean, it, it's not random, it's not full connected, it has a very particular type of structure. Complementary to that, of course, 
at the end of the day, what we want to explain is the emergence of activity, of the dynamics. And this is, can also be characterized in, in many different ways. In this case, it's also with the resonance magnetic uh, imaging in the variants called functional uh, MRI. And what you see is the activity at this microscopic level of the different parts of the brain. Just to give you a flavor, I put it on the top part. I mean, this, uh, this uh, comparison with the, with, the, with the railway system in Europe, so, I mean, we can understand perhaps the railway's connections as the anatomy. And we what would love to, to explain and to model is the rail traffic. Uh, because this is what matters at the end of the day. Well, in the, uh, at the whole brain level, it's exactly the same question. We would love to explain the mechanistic origin of the brain activity and the different circumstances and the different brain states. When my brain is doing nothing, this is what we call technically resting state. When my brain is uh, sleeping, when my brain is uh, con consuming some drugs, or when I am executing a particular cognitive task, working memory, decision making, language, whatever you and, and that is the challenge, and that is the starting point, this empirical observation, how we can link an, uh, anatomy with uh, functional activity. In fact, uh, the, the idea that this linking is relevant is evidenced in this beautiful experiment in 2007, published in Nature, by the lab of Van Essen. This is actually not a human, it's a, it's a monkey brain. Uh, flatten it. And what you see here uh, is on the left side, sorry, is uh, just functional activity of the monkey's light anesthetized. And you see very particular structure in this case uh, showing the coupling between at the, at the activity level, the correlations uh, between two brain regions, parietal and, and frontal. When the monkey is not anesthetized and is awake and is performing a very particular task, it's a visual motor task, we see exactly the same region activated because there are visual motor regions. But the most important part of the whole business is on the right side, on the right panel, we see the anatomy. In this case is very detailed anatomy it's, uh, in the monkeys because it's invasive. And what we see is exactly the same pattern. So uh, this gives us the motivation and the idea that perhaps the wiring, the underlying railways, is really shaping the, the activity, the dynamics of the brain. There is a very beautiful sentence from Aristoteles, uh, translated, of course, in Latin by Thomas Aquina, like uh, most of the things of Aristoteles, which is reflecting this idea, namely, quid quid recipitur at modus recipientis recipitur, which means the container shaped the content. The container here is anatomy, the content is the, the, the water that is inside. And this idea is what we use in modeling. Basically, in this cartoon, resume this whole philosophy. We take the anatomy, we couple with our favorite way of expressing the local neuronal dynamics, of course, the dynamic of millions of neurons, but local at a certain level of parcellation. And we couple, we let interact through the anatomical connections those local dynamics in order to explain the global level of activity uh, of the brain under different situations. And that si very simple idea is the first step of modeling and works. It's extremely simple. Note that here the, the, we break the, the symmetry as we always express in physics. So we introduce heterogeneity in a very simple way, just by the anatomy, nothing else. All the other parts of the brain are homogeneous. And, and astonishing enough, I mean, that works. Of course, we can go beyond that, and we, we can introduce more details. So the next step is really to introduce more heterogeneity, not only at the level of the white matter, anatomy, but also at the level of the gray matter, for example, introducing diversity in the local dynamics, because the regions are very diverse and very different, and we can gain, again, experimentally, the. The, the essential information by different techniques. We can use gene expressions. We can use, for example, PET, positron electron tomography, in order, in that concrete case that I will present now in the next slides, to, to, to derive the density of, uh, of uh, neuro, uh, neuroreceptors. And of course, we are enriching, in that case, the model, and we need to enrich the model in that way in order to be to improve our label of explanation, our mechanistic explanation, just to give you a feeling that how that works. 
This is a particular fitting of brain activity on the y-axis. It's just a measure, a characterization of the functional activity of the, of the, of the rail traffic in the brain. And there are very particular circumstances. This is humans and the humans that uh, were taking psychedelics, LSD. Uh, and what you see really on the left side, very low level of errors. So a very good fitting, a very good explanation of the empirical observation with a model that was enriched with this uh, neuromodulatory uh, information in this case uh, that because we knew that uh, psychedelics are mainly touching a very particular neuroreceptor which is the serotonin we introduced this information in the model and we were able really to improve in a very significant uh, significant way the level of uh, of uh, of fitting on the other side just uh, uh, at the right part of the panel what you see uniform that is the homogeneous model where the only source of heterogeneity is just the anatomy so there is no neuroreceptor information it's a good fitting actually it's not bad it's near 0 0.2 but that is uh, it's competitive it's not bad but of course if we enrich the model in that way we can match so this is the first take home message i mean uh, we can model uh, we need to model because that is giving us information that we cannot gain or that we cannot explicitly see directly in the observed uh, phenomenology. In this case, for example, if you manipulate the, um, the different type of receptor, that is what you see in between all these 5-HT, 1A, 1B, etc., then you see that there is one particular receptor which is very uh, uh, important for this particular drug for LSD, which is the whatever, the 1A. So this is mechanistic information that you cannot uh, uh, observe, but you can infer from the observation thanks to the model. The second way of advancing, of course, one way of advancing is really to introduce more and more details, and so much detail as you need, no more detail than that. Yeah. You know this famous sentence of Einstein, given that Einstein was here, I will mention him. I mean, you need uh, to model things so simple as possible, but not simpler we follow exactly that uh, also in neuroscience the next uh, the step for advancing is not only to enrich the model with more and more details but also to characterize the observation in different ways at the beginning basically we were obsessed and concentrated in the most simple way of resuming the observation which is correlations because it's simple and everybody understands correlation. But we can go beyond uh, correlations and use more so sophisticated, uh, refined way of, uh, of resuming the empirical observation, and we can try to model that refined way of empirical observation. Just to give you a flavor of that, we are using now ideas which are coming from thermodynamics, actually coming from this uh, person, Schrödinger. Everybody knows Schrödinger from uh, quantum physics, uh, for me, was uh, astonishing. I discovered him during the COVID because I was reading the book, uh, What is Life? A very good book, uh, by the way. Uh, and uh, he was very interested in biology. <laughs> and he had to really open a whole field in system biology, which is with the key idea to use non-equilibrium thermodynamics uh, for describing biology. In fact, he associated life with non-equilibrium thermodynamics. Okay, we extend this idea and we try to use this idea at the macroscopic level. And the reason why we can use those ideas is because the, 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 the key feature of non-equilibrium thermodynamics, which sounds horrible for non-physicists, is actually very simple. Is that the system gets non-reversible, meaning that they appear, emerge an arrow of time. And this emergence of an arrow of time, which is very simple to measure because you just have to see the evolution of your signals, in our case, brain signals, in one direction, the natural uh, direction, what we call the forward evolution in time, uh, or reverse that and ask yourself, can I distinguish them or not? If you can distinguish them, that means that the system is non-reversible. That is an arrow of time. If you cannot distinguish them, the system is reversible. Why is that important? Because this is telling us about a reconfiguration of the brain because we know that if the system is balanced and, and the information flow with, between the different parts of the brain is balanced the system is reversible 
if we increase the level of non-equilibrium, of non-reversibility, that uh, implies that the system gets more hierarchical, meaning that there are more asymmetry in the information flow, so that we can measure and characterize mechanistically the underlying orchestration of the brain, so the hierarchical orchestration of the brain, by measuring indirectly this arrow of time and modeling the emergence of this arrow of time. And that is, of course, absolutely fundamental. Just uh, the, the Hollywood version of that, I mean, you see on the left side a typical non-reversible system, a glass of wine shattered by a ballet, a shame per se, by the way, and you see on the top, uh, the, the forward version and the backward version is absolutely intuitive to distinguish them. You know, I mean, the forward version is the one on the top, the other is the reverse. On the other side, you see a typical reversible system on the right side, these uh, colliding billiard balls. And it's absolutely, one is a forward version and the other is the reverse. It's the backward version of the movie. It's impossible to distinguish them. Both are realistic. So, meaning there is no arrow of time. Would be nice if uh, the brain would be like that, that we can just observe the signal and say, oh, you, have, you are non-reversible, or oh, you are reversible. It's not the case. Just to give you an example, as you see on the left side is uh, an excerpt of the movie Tenet from Christopher Nolan. The, I, I love Christopher Nolan. This is the worst movie of Christopher Nolan, by the way. But uh, it's nice for me because it's very pedagogical. There are people traveling forward and backward in time. And it's very easy to know who is who. Because you re realize in this, in this uh, 10 seconds of a uh, movie that there are some guys moving forward and some guys moving back. The right side is a physical system. It's not important which one. It's a spin system, which by construction is non-reversible. We know because we constructed that. I simulated that. Uh, it's non-reversible. I just plot the evolution of one observable. By the way, I don't remember which color was the forward and the backward, and I cannot distinguish them. But I know that the system is not reversible. Well, bad news, the brain is like that. We observe the brain signals, and I cannot say, oh yeah, your level of non-reversibility is 0.7. I cannot say that. I cannot even say if it is zero or different from zero. And therefore, we need uh, methodologies for uh, distinguishing that. One very simple philosophy is reflected, especially on the, on the right panel. You can take your favorite uh, way of measuring brain activity, in this case, for example, fMRI signals. You can work at different levels. You can be at the local level, at the network level, or at the whole brain level. And then, because you can construct your movie, you measure your signals, and then you can reverse by hand, and you know who is whom, then you can train a machine learning tool in order to uh, distinguish them. If the tool is able to distinguish them, we are using here the so-called deep learning architecture for uh, classification, if we are able to distinguish them, that, that means that there is an arrow of time, that means what is more important for us, there is a hierarchical organization, and we can even identify that hierarchical organization by, by model. If not, exactly the contrary. This is just an example, empirical example, application of that. This is a, a huge data set, very successful. Uh, it was a huge project uh, worldwide, mainly uh, funded by the US. It's the so-called Human Connecton Project. There are over 1,000 people, humans, uh, fMRI, under different situations. There are seven different uh, cognitive tasks, which are all compressed in the green box plot, task condition. There are resting conditions, so the, the person are doing nothing. They are just awake. There are two versions because they use two different types of, uh, uh, of tasks. And the label of hierarchy that you can infer indirectly through the arrow of time is significantly different. When you are active, when you are computing something, of course you need to orchestrate things. You need one director or many directors. If you are doing nothing, you don't need so many directors. You are more democratic. And this is exactly what the data are showing. Funny enough, the, the movie watching situation is even more democratic than the resting state situation. It's even more resting than the rest. This is a fallacy with the semantic of calling the resting situation rest. We believe, oh, we are doing nothing. No, you're doing less when you are watching a movie. And this is probably the reason why it's so relaxing. Huh? 
Okay, now a more uh, relevant application uh, of reconfiguration. In its case, it's not because of rewiring, but it's, it's, a, it's a rewiring of the effectivity of the existing wiring. So, and this is the beauty. I mean, remember Aristoteles, ne? you have the, your glass shaping the contents, but uh, it's not fixed. The anatomy is shaping, but it's not determining the contents. We have some extra freedom. We can modulate that. It's like a plastic glass. Uh, and we can do that. These are depressive patients, uh, and they are treated with two different pharmacological uh, uh, drugs. One is the standard on the right, citalopram, typical SRI. The other is psilocybin, which is also fashion nowadays, it's also psychedelics, in microdosis, of course. And what you see, the, the change on the hierarchical organization at the beginning of the treatment and six weeks after treatment. And what you see is totally different. What you see, there is a reconfiguration. So in most of the people, they are responders, so they are getting better. Uh, but it's not so good as, uh, but uh, because of very different type of reconfigurations. And that is very useful. Why? Because we can now see thanks to the experiment and thanks to the modeling in this case, we can infer exactly what was changing. Uh, I don't know, I have a couple, just to, to, to finish with the two, three slides, we see that one of the beauty of modeling is to explain mechanistically some perturbations. Mara was also mentioning genetics perturbation. Here I was referring to pharmacological perturbation. Of course, nowadays, also, we can use other type of perturbations, electromagnetic perturbation. We can perturb different parts of the brains with the magnetic fields, like the technique called TMS, or even at the, at the more uh, um, invasive way with the, what is called deep brain stimulation, with electrical stimulation. And the beauty is that that seems to work. I mean, I, I will show now a, a very brief video that you will see in the Parkinson how magic is this. The problem is that you need to design where you will stimulate. Please remember me, I am also 61, good generations. Uh, in the 61, the, the old uh, television, I don't know if you remember, when something was wrong, you stand up, you bam, <laughs> and work it. Why? Because they use it valves. I mean, nowadays they are not using valves anywhere, anymore, so the, it's not working anymore. But of course, it would be much more effective to have a plan of the television and know which part you have to touch in order to get the, the result. So at the moment, it's, it really works. In this it's case, placed into the brain. I understand. Just I put it comes only. level with the top of the nose and the ear, and it is connected to a battery in my chest. So this in, a person uh, in my uh, with Parkinson's skin in my the chest here. Oxford, and this is controlled. Parkinson and got I can control the, the amount of the he voltage normal, going in. Right? I can control the length of time that the pulse. A little problem in language, if you. And are, I can if you identify see the videos two times, you will realize the number of times per second. But now he will in. disconnect the DBS, and then you will see well, the magic of this perturbation. Connect. Not an actor. I, I know him personally. It's real. It's incredible, it's shocking. So I interrupt. So the modeling, and, I, and this is how I would like to finish my talk, give us a plan, a mechanistic plan, uh, how to interact with the brain. Even more, we can now use the model, individualize it for a very particular person, for a very particular disease, and try to reach a, a, a transition to a more healthy functional state, and I can do this offline in silico, try extensively, also ethically, is, <laughs> we are allowed, we don't need to, to ask, I mean, how can I perform all the stimulations in all possible parts with all possible protocols, we cannot do exhaustively and design which one is the most successful. That works, I finished just that with that, I mean, this is our cases of coma patients, Really very beautiful because we got data from the best two clinics in Europe, which are in Paris, Lionel Nakash, and, uh, and in Liège, Steve Lorry. Uh, many 
are uh, around 40, 50 uh, patients with different degree of coma. Uh, and I don't have the, the time to explain, but what you see in these <laughs> colorful uh, uh, renderings are the regions that really could awake potentially those patients. And this is really uh, something that is happening now. I mean, they are trying really to use now this information and combine with pharmacology or with the electromagnetic stimulation and see if they react. I think I finish here. I hope that the take home message is clear. Modeling is possible, it's necessary, and there are many advantages. So we need a model. But of course, in order to start modeling, we need the experiments. <laughs> if not, we can do nothing. We can do mathematics, but which is fun, but nothing uh, serious. Thank you. <laughs>